So, everybody ready to start again? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, during the break I was asked about the whole open source thing and uh, to now pull back and talk about the show in general as opposed to specifically about Kate's practice. Uh, the idea for basically um, open source is a term that uh, is used in the computer, uh, the IT industry, and every program has its source code and when you have open source it means that anybody is allowed to copy that code, modify it, and come up with a better program, change the program so that it works better for them, change the program so that it works better for everybody. And uh, upon seeing that, I realized that's effectively how all art is made. It's the sort of thing you see how something is made, and then at which point you modify it and change it. And then because we needed uh, some sort of easy, punchy sort of uh, title that was easily translatable, copy-paste seemed to be most appropriate. Uh, it's the sort of thing with uh, Mitchell Chan's work, which are the two paintings here. There are the three uh, paintings way back in uh, the other end, and then uh, the Don, what we affectionately call the Don, which is the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha, or the ingenious gentleman of La Mancha, Don Quixote. I'm, I always get those two confused. Um, which also was where, once I saw that, it was you know, open source, because he is actually using open source code so as to make that, because there, uh, I don't know now the Windows open if anybody is going to be able to ascertain it, but it's basically he is spelling out the, uh, what called, the, the book, Don Quixote, letter by letter, <laughs> using the smoke rings. And it is the sort of thing where the smoke rings are actually uh, room temperature water vapor, and this was where my sense of sort of awe and wonderment and surprise and uh, just all sorts of wow, the wow factor came in because once you realize that you say, so how does this get done? What happens? Where did that idea come from? And one of the things to take a step back is unfortunately, I, yeah, I should have read Don Quixote when I was uh, in high school, didn't get around to it. Uh, now I keep planning on it, planning on it, planning it hasn't happened. But uh, I've been told that it's basically, and I'm certain all of you have read it and know it way better than I do, but for, in case anybody out there is like me, I'll give you the synopsis that I've been told, which is basically it's about a search for the uh, search for truth and the ephemer ephemerality of truth. And Mitchell came up with the idea of realizing that uh, water vapor, the smoke rings, is as ephemeral as it gets. It's they're there and then they disappear. And so his sort of um, realizing that this was a, would be a valid translation of it. And then as far as the technology goes behind it, it's basically he discovered that uh, you take a bucket of water and you vibrate uh, what you want, the water at about two inches below the surface and it will naturally make steam. And then there's a fan which sucks up the steam and then if anybody has been on the metro recently, you know the advertising panels they have on the orange line which have the LED lights yes. that spell out letters? Yes. That's, if you look at the smoke rings as LEDs, and so you get a T which is like this, which is dot, 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 and a string of dots down here. It's the same sort of smoke rings, uh, the smoke rings are doing the same thing as the LEDs would for spelling it. And there it's, there's a little machine which is called an Arduino, which is basically a microprocessor, which is the same sort of uh, microprocessor that's uh, making my video camera work, which is the same sort of, sort of, yeah, that will make your watch work and so on. It just is specific things. And so he basically feeds in a text file, a Word document, into this uh, machine called an Arduino. It looks at each letter individually says, okay, this is the grid that it's got to be put on, and then it sends a signal saying, okay, the E needs these seven uh, things, to, these five things to move in this way, and it just sends a signal going bump, 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 and if you listen closely, you can hear each of the speakers go pop, because after the fan comes in, it then uses the speaker cones to push the air. It's not complicated. <laughs> <laughs> And it, does it, it makes sense, did what I say make sense to anybody? <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Anyhow, to me it's a sort of thing where it's a wonderful sort of thing just because of taking the theme for Don Quixote, translating it to something else as ephemeral as water vapor. And then I've heard it, I'm not certain if this is going to happen or not, but he has, 
in installing it this time has decided that he's going to be adding a second part to it for the next one, which is where he then takes a dehumidifier, puts it in the same room so that it sucks out the water vapor from the air, brings it back into water, which then ends up writing on the page. And so he will translate Don Quixote from the written word into uh, water vapor, back from water vapor into water onto the page. Okay. <laughs> and as far as, yeah, to me, it's absolutely wonderful with um, his, uh, which all, the, the paintings and stuff like that, the thing that I found fascinating is this was the first time I'd seen these. I'd seen Wall of Death uh, earlier, but these ones which have whole complicated names that are, uh, but anyhow, so you can definitely see the Rothko effect in terms of just the sort of splash of color. But there it's, I had assumed that his, because he likes working in taking two dimensional objects, such as a novel, turning it into three dimensions by making it into a sculpture, the paintings do the same sort of two dimensions into three dimensions. And I had thought that it was just the strings and the sort of gears, but then when we actually installed it, to see that that elastic moves very, very slowly absolutely fascinated me and it's the sort of thing where I can stand in front of that for probably easily 15 minutes watching them move at their own sort of pace and uh, one of the effects with that is that it's the sort of thing where the line artificially places a horizon there and it sort of marks okay this is where it stops this is where it uh, ends this is where it starts and so on and at which point by moving it it makes you realize that that horizon is endlessly variable and so on, and it's with the um, wall of death in the back where it's basically the spinning elastics. And again, it's, he's working off of uh, what's called, uh, abstract expressionism, copying Rothko pretty much uh, as easy as get out. And um, then he puts an elastic in front of it, and then depending on how tight the elastic is and how fast the motor is spinning, gives you the sense of uh, waves in terms of, if I remember correctly, on the right-hand side, there are six undulation, un, undulations. In the middle, there are eight. And on the far left, there are 10. And uh, there, because it's called Wall of Death, you have the sort of association between sound waves, <coughs> also the motors themselves are making sound, and then also there was something else, but I just spaced on it. <laughs> um, with, uh, mm -hmm, pardon? I don't know what you were thinking. Okay. Now it's there, it's also with um, Pippa's work, which we have here as a sort of maquette sort of uh, installation, but have you all seen the tree sweaters that are outside? Yes, yes, that was the basic idea with her. And to me, knitting is the sort of thing where it's, um, yeah, the, or the, or uh, which one, the, the, first, uh, the first type of open source, because as far as I know, although I don't knit, most people, the way that they learn to knit is at their grandmother's knee. And it is a sort of thing, copy this and then let's go forward. One knitting circles, like there's a sense of community. I know that I, I used to meet with girls every week and you can share problems if one person is, can't quite figure out a pattern or is having difficulties, somebody else might be able to help them. And, and so as far as working into the source, it's right. exactly that, it, or the idea behind the concept behind the show, it fits in perfectly. And there it's one thing that I've always been extremely aware of is how uh, sexist the art world is. And it's the sort of thing that you go back through history and for the most part uh, the art that women made was considered secondary, it was considered craft, it was considered um, utilitarian and it wasn't put up in museums and so on. Uh, here in Quebec, uh, what, in between 2001 and 2006, uh, the Musée d'Art Contemporain did not show a single uh, solo exhibition by a woman, which is extremely surprising because you figure we're supposed to be fairly progressive here. But they didn't, now they have three up at the same time, so they're sort of rebalancing it. For it. <laughs> but it is the sort of thing that knitting has traditionally been considered a woman's craft and so on, and uh, there's Yarn bombing, which is the term that is used for putting sweaters on trees or on lampposts or on uh, where? On statues. Yeah, on statues. Uh, it's the sort of thing that got invented by this woman. I want to space on her name, but anyhow, in 2005 in Austin, Texas, she was running a uh, craft shop, and uh, it was slow business, and so she just decided she was going to knit a cozy for her doorknob. 
and she got such a reaction to that that it then started spreading like wildfire, especially with the help of uh, email and Facebook and all sorts of stuff like that. And uh, the thing that I find fascinating with yarn bombing is uh, the similarities between the graffiti, graffiti and uh, the yarn bombing in that the graffiti is where you have, for the most part, a bunch of dis disaffected youth who are trying to say, look at me, I exist, pay attention to me, and so on. And then you have the people who are not the graffiti artists looking at it as it's an extremely destructive, uh, what's it malicious type of art form, or maybe or it's they, not art. or they don't even call it art, sort of thing where, uh, yeah, taking, being a little bit sexist myself, but given that for the most part they're not, that still not that many male knitters, that when the women decided that they were going to modify the landscape so as to let people know that they were disaffected, but that they existed and look at me, look at me, look at me, they do it in a way that is not as harmful to the environment, that it is much more friendly, much more, much more, much more um, playful and enjoyable. Why trees? Um, it's the sort of thing where my understanding is that because the branches, in terms of if you just put a sleeve it's not the most engaging type of thing unless you actually change the colors, change the pattern. And given the nature of trying to put up something, it's you want to do it as quickly, as easily as possible. It still is immensely illegal. Mm. And then by being able to form it around the branches, it's sort of like you've made the sweater for that tree individually, and it's, you sort of have that sense of wonder, well, so how did they get it over the branch yeah. and there? And having seen Pip install it, I know exactly how they do it. But because I, from an environmentalist point of view, I see it as like, look at the trees, you know, like pay attention to them. Or, or this idea of, you know, I think of knitting for soldiers, this idea of trying to add um, comfort and, I don't know. The well, tree they, must be important. Yeah, yeah well, they're, they're within, the, well, I'm thinking of yarn bombing as a whole, as where a whole, it is all over the place. Here specifically, why the tree, why the trees? Yeah. There are no lampposts. <laughs> we have lots of trees around here. So it was in discussion with her, was trying to say, let's do it on the trees because there's not other okay. stuff around. Okay. And then also she has the other piece, uh, which I'll way back at the back, which is called Again and Again and Again, where um, it only occurred to me after installing it that it was, uh, which one, again, another way of copy and copying and Hasting, taking something that was two-dimensional, making it three-dimensional, in that uh, the line is from a uh, poem by Rilke, and uh, for whatever reason, Pippa found it a very powerful line, and then decided to turn it into a bunch of uh, handmade, knitted, crocheted, and embroidered books. And the other thing that I like about that that I find absolutely fascinating is realizing we actually have two artists in here uh, who have work that was based on the written page that have been translated into a three-dimensional sculptural item, and I just say, that's pretty damn cool. Yeah. It's almost like I knew what I was doing before I started. 